Literacy is dead. At least, that's what a lot of people are saying. We don't think it's true. We do, however, think literacy is about to look different. A lot different. For many people, the words the end signify either satisfaction or sorrow. What happens after the end? How do words become catalysts for progress and advancement? Join us today for The Afterword, a conversation about the future of words. Hi, I'm Amy Bolin, literacy specialist, writer, and college instructor. And I'm Holland Webb, a full-time writer and editor. And this is The Afterword. Last week, we began our conversation with Jenny Dellinger, instructional coach and science educator, and Thomas Locke, a best-selling science fiction author, about using story to explore STEM. We learned about how emotional connections and science, when they're linked together, create a really powerful educational experience. So join us today for the conclusion of that conversation. So Thomas and Jenny, we're so glad that you're with us. Uh, Just some of the words that we heard on our last episode, this idea of complexity and character and how we can make a change, even some of the the new vocabulary maybe that people had not heard before. And I would love for each of you, Thomas and Jenny, to think about a metaphor that helps us understand the relationship between science and story. So Thomas, I'm going to call on you first. What do you think would be a good metaphor to help us understand this idea of science and story? I think the first thing has to be breaking down. What you what you want in a good story is an element, some introduction in the beginning that creates a mystery, something that is so big and so complex that there is, in effect, no answer that's visible. But if you have characters, if you, if you build a world where the people are alive and breathing and they're afraid and they have these desires that can only be met by confronting this impossible challenge, then the first thing they have to do is to break it down into identifiable pieces. And that basically is is what a scientist has to do. They take the unsolvable mystery that they are facing at the moment, and they bind it first to the things that have been discovered in the past, and then they try to extend this knowledge through careful inspection, deliberation, research, and years of work. Mm. That's uh, a lot to think about in that metaphor, but I like the idea of the the breaking down and the mystery. Uh, Jenny, can you talk a little bit about a metaphor to help us relate to science and story? Mine is very similar. So my thought process <laughs> was, you know, when we think of scientists, a lot of times, you know, we think of them as this, and, and some are, granted, are, you know, very intelligent. They had to do really well in school, but I think it's important when we think of science and stories that we see scientists as normal people and that they had to problem solve, you know, to get where they are and that you are going to have bumps in the road or setbacks and you have to persevere. And so it's important, I think, when you look at the two to understand that there are struggles, but at the end, you push through the struggles and um, you can be successful. So if, listening to him was like, that's similar to what I'm about to say. So that was kind of funny. I'm sorry. I have to interrupt. That is just, <laughs> that is so true. I'll give you an example of each. I have a nephew. I can remember I, I was working in Germany at the time, and I came back to Raleigh, North Carolina, and my, my nephew's mother brought me into his room. He was, let's see, he was 13 at the time. And Mason had this series of leather-bound notebooks. They were <laughs> they were so expensive. These padded leather-bound notebooks that had been given to him by a Research Triangle Park software company. And Mason's job at 13 was to do the final proofing of their new software formulas. And I would watch him. He would get up. He would open up. Thing. He'd go in, he'd have dinner with the family, and then he'd do his homework, and he'd come in, and he'd sit down at the, at the desk. And he would open up the notebook, and he would read, like I was reading a novel, he would read the lines of software. So Mason has gone on to become the president of this software company, and life for him has been fairly straightforward and easy. The other side of this is I have a friend who now teaches math at UCLA who comes from a divorced family who was 
raised in a terrible situation, and his mother was doing hourly work, hourly paid work at Best Buy, and ended up becoming the personal aide of the wife of a movie mogul. And after she had been doing this for four years, five years, the mogul's wife decided that it was too much trouble to have this aide drive an hour from East L.A. to, to get to their place in Bel Air. And so she moved the family into what used to be the gardener's quarters at the bottom of their Bel Air estate. And this is where my guy entered into basically understanding that there was a world beyond East L.A., which is a pretty awful place. And he was allowed to use the swimming pool until 8 in the morning, so he ended up with a swimming scholarship and went to UCLA Swim School and entered into the math program because he had this opportunity. So there are these two very different arenas that ended up developing – minds that are basically designing the next generation of software for America. So you're absolutely right. It's it's a wonderful example, Jenny. Really, these opportunities and these these discoveries, they can come from anywhere. Shut up everybody else. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. It, you know what? <laughs> It's it's really good information, Thomas, and I think when we consider what we've been talking about over the last episode and even today and the power, I think that's the, the beauty of what I'm hearing about this fabric of you were sharing earlier uh, how, how science and the story becomes this fabric of the character. And you're explaining these two people whose lives the, the fabric has been altered and I think, Jenny, you've talked about as you used a story prompt to consider what would be in the future, what would be something that the your students would have created. And, you know, many of the future careers rest in experimental science and applied science. And so, Jenny, what role can storytellers play in a science-driven world of the future? Ooh, um Think back to some of your students and some of the stories they wrote and maybe something that would have been a creative possibility for the future. Uh, I know that um, one of the units that we taught was on inventions. And one of the things that the students had to do was create an invention that wasn't in existence now, and then they had to write about it. And, um, you know, it didn't necessarily have to be an informational piece. It could be you know, adding fantasy to it, you know, it was a lot of loose work that they could do within that. And so they were able to invent something, but also to pull in some of that writing as well and may not be specific, this is what it has to be. And I think that's an important piece, especially when, you know, you're talking about science, is you don't set limits for students. You let them write creatively and, and share their ideas. And, I mean, you have no idea what type of um, result that you'll get, and the kids will be excited about their work and what they're sharing with you and others. And I think what I heard from you, Jenny, was the idea of no limits and being creative. Yes. And so, mm -hmm. Thomas, obviously, with 80 books plus in your in your repertoire, have you experienced that with your creativity? And uh, how do you move past some limits that you might fight, face as a writer? I have. And also in, in teaching, I, I really like what Jenny has to say. It's, I think one of the things that, that really bonds me with what Jenny is doing is this issue of the creative effort. I, I teach both at Oxford in their creative writing program and uh, lecture all over the world and, and uh, on the aspects of what they call the creative discipline of fiction. But really it's all about storytelling and how do you make the story from one culture fit into something that has a global audience. And one of the issues that we have to deal with on a – Literally, with every class I teach is exactly what Jenny is describing is how do you tell these people that it's okay to dream big, to move mm -hmm. beyond what is acceptable? And, I mean, for example, the last time I taught outside this region was in Singapore, and about half of my class came from communist China. And in dealing with a classroom full of these people that are, I mean, there was a watcher in the classroom while we were teaching, and there's this need to tell them that it's okay to break away, 
that part of what happens in telling story is that you learn to dream big. And I think in terms of the science, that's one of the great opportunities that you are inviting people to build upon the foundation of what they know is now and create things that could potentially be reality tomorrow. I mean, that's, that's a lovely element. When we think about dreaming big, let's, let's think about two concepts here that, that I think you, you just sort of alluded to. The one is more women than men attend college. And yet women are s- severely underrepresented in STEM fields. The other has to do with uh, sort of looking at this on a global level, countries that have the scientific resources and, and the brain trust to thrust technology and scientific experimentation forward are doing so at this incredibly rapid rate. And those countries that don't have that access or that are unable to control intellectual property laws are falling further and further behind in this uh, sort of race forward. It's impacting their economy. It's impacting their ability to compete at a global level. So looking at both of those things, gender and global inequality, how can literature help correct that imbalance as we think about science and the future? Anyone? Jenny? <laughs> You want to start? You want me to? Ooh, <laughs> that is a tough one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thomas, you mentioned a little bit in your in your visit to Singapore, so you might have personal experience a little bit with that. Uh, yes, not so much the, the gender issue because in in writing fiction, that is really that's just not that big a deal. The question is quality. It's it's really not gender, but. On the scientific side, what you are looking for in writing good fiction basically are fault lines. Fault lines are places where the culture is effectively being riven by something that creates that friction like the the, the sand within the, the oyster. You you need something that is going to to spur the change. And in, in writing a good story, you're always looking for that emotional foundation that's going to create a, a boom, a, a wow moment where the person rises beyond themselves and becomes something more. And I think really what Jenny was talking about in terms of her work within the classroom, everything she's doing is basically pushing the students towards this moment of rising up beyond the definitions of who the world sees them as or who they are in terms of their own eyes and becoming something greater. And really, I don't know what else to say but that. I think I think that is absolutely crucial. Jenny, you want to speak to that? Yeah, well, and you talked about the underrepresentation in the STEM fields. And one way literature can, or things that can be done in the classroom can help with that is You know, when you think about, and inevitably, you're going to learn about scientists when you're studying throughout the years. And typically, as a female, I think back to, did I ever really learn about any female scientists? I don't recall. I remember it, you know, mostly it being males. And so I think, you know, part of it is to help with that gender imbalance, especially at an early age, is to let these girls know, and boys too, but girls specifically, if they're not going into this field, these are all the things that women have done too because they've heard so much about the men. So I think that may help a little bit of a shift is to try and balance if you are introducing um, your students to even different characters in books, that you have a counterbalance between the two so that they're getting that exposure and that light bulb is coming on, well, girls can do this too, because I think a lot of times that's kind of the obstacle or the, or the thing against them is they don't see themselves there, and so they don't go in that direction. I think about, as you were talking, I was thinking about the show and the series of books, Bones, by uh, Kathy Reichs. Mm-hmm. She's a forensic anthropologist yeah. and a novelist. They were great. 
Yeah. Grey's Anatomy is another. I mean, I think that's one reason why the season has been, the, the series has been so successful is because it mm-hmm. does effectively defy a lot of the definitions that people have about medicine in American society. Speaking of a book on medicine, um, have, have either of you read Cutting for Stone by Abraham Verghese? Yes, I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. That, that was, uh, that was an interesting, it, it's a long book, but I, you have to get one of the electronic versions so you can flip quickly through the boring bits. But it's a great story. <laughs> well, I was sitting in the car listening to it on Audible, and I remember some of the places where he would describe, uh, you know, a baby being birthed, or uh, you know, somebody going through liver transplants, or uh, there was a vasectomy at one point. I mean, there were just incredibly detailed information that was woven into. A riveting story about um, you know this this kind of oddly collected family in Ethiopia it became a huge bestseller. What are your favorite fiction works that include science? Uh, <laughs> the works that I like particularly are the ones that um, I'm looking for an interesting character that develops from beginning to end. So I wouldn't say that I have one particular author or series that I really like. When I'm looking for a really solid piece of um, fiction that's science-related, that I'm looking for um, it to be entertainment, entertaining and for them to be something that they've been able to figure out throughout the book. How about you, Thomas? Right now, I'm just sitting here listening to Jenny. I cannot think of a single book that I really, really like recently that has mm-hmm. not had a scientific element. So I would say mm-hmm. my entire passion is based around this idea of marrying good story with good science. And I agree with everything Jenny just said. I will say one thing that um, we have noticed at our school here recently is our students really are into graphic novels. And so I would say that if, you know, there's anything that has a lot of the graphics and the comic book characteristics that could be tied into um, some science topics, that that would be something that I think kids would really get a big interest in. You know, it's interesting that you say that. But the most recent movie that I've seen was Alicia. It was released on Friday. And the, the the group that did this is the group that did Armageddon and Avatar. It's, it's two different creative groups that came together to do this CGA novel. And the reason why they did this was because they were both the Titanic group, which did Armageddon, and the Avatar group, which did Lord of the Rings, was they were both fanatics of this Japanese uh, graphic novelist. Mm-hmm. I have no. If I knew it, I couldn't say it. But it's interesting because this is the only novel that I can think of recently that has that sense of great, powerful characters with a really strong emotional structure that deal with artificial intelligence. Excellent. Well, you know, I I do think that it is fascinating. And Jenny, I don't know how you see this, but. When I see a student get that aha moment where something that was confusing, Thomas, you talk about uh, these fault lines, you invite people to dream big, to understand their culture through some learning. And it's so exciting to see when there can be a marrying of the learning component and the story component. And I know for me, when I watch students and they've learned something that's prior to our reading has been a mystery to them, and now it has become unlocked. Even something as simple as how popcorn actually pops and, you know, learning about how grapes become raisins. So even something as simple as that can be an exciting storyline for our students, especially because some of them have not been exposed to that. Yeah, that aha moment as an educator, is it it makes you smile the whole rest of the day. You know, when when something just clicks, it, it, I'm totally with you there, Amy. It just it's a great feeling. And I think that we see that even with um, our readers, Thomas. When someone has enjoyed your book, and maybe they've given you that feedback, and you they have a connection to what you've done, and they've learned something in the process. Uh, that must be something that, as an author um, and as a teacher, that you have uh, good experiences with. Yeah, 
Um, I was in Los Angeles last week working on a film project, and I had a group of fans who came together. I had put a blog out saying that I was going over and that I was very nervous, both in terms of having this actually move forward and also terrified that it might move forward. (laughs) (laughs) It was just really nice. It's exactly what you were describing, that sense of bonding at the aha moment where Mm -hmm. they were supportive because they were confident that the studio was interested because they too had that aha moment. It is a gift. I have been a writer for Well, I wrote for nine years and finished seven books before my first was accepted for publication, so I have been a writer for 40 years, and those aha moments are a gift. They never grow old. Well, that is an encouragement. (laughs) Absolutely. I've had several aha moments in the last half hours we've had this conversation. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Thomas, for joining us and for talking about this subject. Next week, we'll be talking with an award-winning illustrator, Tim Davis, and the former art director for Science Magazine and the former art director for Highlights for Children, Cynthia Faber-Smith, about how illustrations work with words to weave powerful stories for children and adults alike. So don't forget to subscribe to theafterwardpodcast.com, like us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And join us next week with Tim and Cindy talking about how illustrations convey stories. And as always, you are welcome at our table.